Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the Free Society Scholars Annual Research Presentation. It is my pleasure to present to you our 2021-2022 Free Society Scholars. Ashlyn Vermeer is a freshman. Brenda Mata is our sophomore. Destiny McClintock is our junior scholar. And Jesse Cole is our senior scholar. Now, I want to give you a little background on the Free Society Scholarship Program. This is part of the Mormon Foundation grant uh, and the Free Society events that I do throughout the year. As you may know, the Free Society system is based upon three foundations, a democratic form of government, the free market system, and strong cultural institutions. As part of the scholarship program, students work through these foundations beginning with the democratic form of government and culminating in a synthesis of the three pillars. These scholarships were secured by these four students, one in each grade. These students were selected based on an admissions essay where they explained what a free society meant to them and their community. It has been my pleasure to work more closely with these students on these topics, and I am grateful to the Mormon Foundation for the opportunity to do so. After selection, after these ladies were selected, they were given research topics according to their academic grade. The freshman scholar, the sophomore scholar, etc. Uh, they researched these topics throughout the year, uh, and during this process, I have attempted to guide their studies without imposing my personal beliefs or context upon their analysis or conclusions. Today, you will see the results of their research with their own insights upon the foundations of a free society. Uh, further, our freshman scholar studies the democratic form of government. Our sophomore scholar studies the free market system. Our junior scholar studies cultural institutions and their benefits to a free society. And then our senior scholar has to synthesize all of those things into one cohesive topic. The first scholar today to present is our freshman scholar, Ashlyn Vermeer, who will speak to you about the importance of a democratic form of government. Hello, everyone. As Professor Hall said, my name is Ashlyn Vermeer. I'm the freshman scholar, and I'm a business major here at HLGU. My pillar is the democratic form of government. Um, just to give everyone a little background, as Professor Hall said, the three pillars are the democratic form of government, the free market systems, and strong sociocultural institutions. Democracy stems from the Greek word demos and kratos, meaning rule by the people. This is foundational as a democracy, meaning the people have the power within a government, not the government having power over the people. The best example we have of a democracy is America, we, although we are a democratic republic. We have continued our legacy of being one of the freest countries in the world. I think everyone knows the basics of our foundations, but I want to look through it as a lens of what helped us become a free society. The American Revolution. America fought tirelessly to defeat the British and their imposed control on us when we first came over. We signed the Declaration of Independence on July 4, 1776. That's why every year we get to blow stuff up, and who doesn't love that? <laughs> our founding fathers took their time in coming up with a, with a government that would last. On September 4, 17, 1787, the first 10 amendments of the Constitution were voted to be adopted. According to USAGov, the foundations of the American government, its purpose, form, and structure are in the Constitution. Something I want to weave throughout my presentation is the importance of a written constitution within a government. A written constitution helps so the government can't overreach on the people. It limits their power. On December 15, 1791, the Bill of Rights was ratified. These three documents are often known as the Charters of Freedom and have secured the rights for the American people for over two and a half centuries. One thing I really want to point out is that in the preamble of the Constitution, it says to form a more perfect union, meaning we can't have perfection, but we can strive to do our absolute best to secure the rights and freedoms for the American people. History has shaped the way our government continues to run in present day, as we have the three-party system, the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. We have government on both the federal level and the state level, which helps with the separation of power. And having the separation of the power on the state level and the government level, or and the federal level, really helps with this. And the separation of power stops from one person or a group of people from getting all the power. Because people are free, our government works. 
We have personal freedoms, as stated in our First Amendment. We have the freedom of religion, the freedom of speech, the freedom of press, and the freedom of petition. People have power to create change within our government, whether that be by their vote, or whether that be by their protesting when they think something has been done wrong. We have the power to create change. We also have freedoms to choose where to go to school, where to work, what businesses we want to open, what state we want to live in, where we want to spend our money, where we want to go to church. We have choices and we have freedoms within our own lives. The cool thing about our freedom is that we have freedom up until the point where we impose on someone else's freedom. That's when we have people like the police who can step in for protection. While we do enjoy the freedom and a free society here in America, not everyone does enjoy a free society. My first example is Venezuela, which is a socialist country. They don't have any separation of power within their government with their current president. And this has led to some severe things within their government. So Supreme Court packing, no political opposition, so he can stay in power as long as he wants. And they're working on rewriting their constitution, which ties back to the theme of how a constitution is so important within a government because it limits their power. So why does this matter? Why are they not a free society? <coughs> well, well, let's look at the people who live there. One of the worst humanitarian and refugee crises is going on there. 96% of people who live there live below the poverty line, with 70% of people living in extreme poverty. And the inflation rate as of 2021 is 686.4%, so their money is almost worthless. This is a great example of how government can hurt a country. My second example is China, which is an example of a communist country. They have a dictator who runs all their branches of government, and their leader also runs unopposed for office, so he can stay in power as long as he wants. They also have a very planned economy, which Brenda will talk about later. Again, so what's happening to the people there? Why aren't they a free society? Well, I think it's really interesting the viewpoints I get to see here at college. So I do have a girl from China in some of my classes, and we talk about government and business, and we talk about economies, and we talk about different things like that, and she won't participate in any of these conversations because they can face severe persecution if they talk about their government structure, if they step out of line in that way. They're going through a severe humanitarian crisis as well. And they don't have the freedom of speech, the freedom of press, the freedom of religion. If they have an idea, they can share it with themselves, and they can share it with their family. Also, the government is controlling almost every facet of their lives. From 1980 to 2016, they had the one-child policy in China, meaning that they could only, every family could have one child. And if they tried to have another child, or if they did have another child, a government official would show up at their door and kill the child. In 2017, that became the two-child policy. And in 2018, that became the three-child policy, which they still have today. My final example is the United Kingdom, which is a parliamentary monarchy. The United Kingdom's government is made up of the House of Lords, the House of Commons, and the monarchy, often referred to as the Queen. There is more of a democracy aspect within their government as some government positions are elected by the people rather than appointed, which is why they're going to score better on economic freedom scales like the Cato Institute. But unlike the US, the UK has no written constitution. Again, this ties back to my theme of the government can do whatever they want when they have nothing limiting their power. They can change, rule, they can change rules and laws at a moment's notice. And that's why only certain people can have privately owned cars, and that's why they can tax certain foods like sugar. They also have some of the strictest gun laws. And although this can be a controversial topic within our country, it just shows that we have freedoms here in America that the government cannot infringe upon. Whereas in the United Kingdom, they, they have freedom. They don't have the freedoms, and the government can infringe on those. All of these examples to say, when the government rules, it comes with oppression, human rights issues, dictatorship, and not being able to protect yourself from the government. But it's been proven for centuries that when the people rule rather than the government, it brings personal freedom, protection, and ownership. This really hits home for me as a business major because it fosters that entrepreneurial spirit. If I want to own a business or if I want to go into certain industry within business, I can do it as long as I work hard for it. That's why I can proudly say I live in a free society. Thank you. Questions. Alrighty, thank you.
Hello, my name is Brenda Mata and I am a sophomore Free Society Scholar. Today I will be talking on the free market system. If the thing works. So I'd like to start out by giving a brief overview on what this presentation will cover. First, it will define what the free market system is and how it works in three different political economic systems. These systems com um, comprise of the capitalist system, the communist system, and the socialist system. So first, let's look at and define what a free market is. According to LearnLiberty.org, it is an economic system based on supply and demand for goods and services, with little to no government control involved in its operation. In other words, a free market is based on supply and demand and not controlled by the government and what it thinks the market needs. There are specific characteristics and benefits of a free market. According to Corporate Finance Institute, it is private ownership of resources, thriving financial markets, and freedom to participate. The benefits also include the freedom to innovate and customer-driven choices. So now that we have a basic understanding of what a free market is and its characteristics and benefits, let's plug it into the different political and economic systems. So the first system we're looking at is the capitalist system. So what is the capitalist system? According to Merriam-Webster, it is an economic system characterized by private or corporate ownership of capital goods by investments that are determined by private decision and by prices, production, and the distribution of goods that are de determined mainly by competition in a free market. Through its definition, we can see that this allows for a free market. So how do I know this? <clears throat> According to the characteristics mentioned previously, there must be little to no government involvement with the market. A capitalist system allows healthy competition, and this allows the market to fluctuate on its own. In other words, according to cons according in other words, depending on what the consumers buy or don't buy, the market fluctuates to accommodate and meet the needs and demands of the consumers. For a free market to work, government control and restrictions must be very minimal and non-existent. In a proper capitalist system, this is true and thus allows a free market to exist. Another factor that a capitalist system has that allows a free market to exist is private ownership of goods and production of goods. While in a free market there would only be production solely through the private sector, the capitalist system allows for both private ownership as well as corporate ownership of capital goods. A capitalist system allows a free market to work and thrive. Therefore, a free market works in a capitalist system. The second system we're going to look at today is the socialist system. According to Merriam-Webster, socialism is any of various economic and political theories advocating collective or governmental ownership and administration of the needs of production and distribution of goods. The characteristics of a socialist um, system is that it does not allow private control of factors of production and it allows the government to take control of the market and property. It also does not allow healthy competition. According to its definition and characteristics, socialism doesn't allow a free market system because the government or a central planner is given the authority to determine the needs and wants of the market versus allowing the market to fluctuate on its own. This slide has a picture of a Soviet grocery store from the 1990s. In this picture, does anything look strange to you at all? Do you notice how bare the shelves are? This is due to the fact that the socialist system is controlled by the government or central planner. No person or small group of people can determine the needs and wants of the market. This can cause shortages and surpluses as we see here in this photo. The last system we'll be looking at today is the communist system. According to Merriam-Webster, it is a system in which goods are owned in common and are available to all as needed, a theory of advocating elimination of private property. A communist system is solely under government control or a dictatorship. This type of political system pretty much eliminates the market and replaces it with central planners who regulate the needs and wants of the market and regulate supply and demand. In other words, a communist system it has a command economy. A free market is not possible in a communist system. A free market requires freedom in the market, 
freedom of the consumer that allows them to decide what they buy, how much they buy, and from whom they buy it. It also allows producers and sellers to decide what they produce, how much they produce, and for how much they sell their products. For a free market to exist, supply and demand which must fluctuate, must be allowed to fluctuate due to the demands of the market. A communist system does not allow this, but rather puts certain people in place who determine what the market needs. This causes severe shortages and surpluses. Therefore, a communist system does not allow for a free market to exist, much less thrive. Based on the information today, capitalist system is the only system mentioned that allows for a free market system to exist, much less thrive. While a capitalist system does not allow for a completely free market, since most of the time the government has some kind of control in the government, in the market, it does allow a free system to exist successfully. Unlike the capitalist system, socialism and communism have command economies versus a free market system. Therefore, a capitalist system is the best system for a free market to exist and thrive. Thank you for your time and your attention. I hope you enjoyed this quick presentation and have gained a bit more knowledge on the free market system and how it worked in the capitalist, socialist, and communist systems. And here are my references. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Destiny and I'm the Junior Scholar. Today I'll be talking to you about cultural institutions and a free society. You've been hearing about the components of a free society as Ashlyn discussed the democratic form of government and Brenda explained the free market system. Now I'll be talking to you about the third pillar, cultural institutions. I think it's important to first start with what a free society is. A free society is a community acting on their own will with little government interference. As Americans, we have the right to the First Amendment. It's in our Constitution. The First Amendment states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. According to the First Amendment, we have the freedom of speech, religion, and press. According to a free society, we have cultural institutions where we have the choice to make our own decisions. We can choose what religion we want to be, what language we want to speak, what school we want to put our children in, and what church we go to on Sundays. Today I will hit on four main cultural institutions. Religion, like the church, education, like school systems, charity, and government welfare. And I want to emphasize that you have personal choices in all of these options. Religion. The church is an example of rights and freedom in a free society. In my research, I focused on the Christian church in America versus Europe. In America, we focus on the book of the Bible. We live to be image barriers of Christ. We believe Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And when we die, we will have eternal life with him in heaven. According to a study done by ABC News, 38% of Americans stated that they attended church at least once a week. In contrast, Christians in Europe, 18% that they only go to church once a month. And according to Pew Research Center, non-practicing Christians in Europe stated that they do not believe in the biblical depiction of God, but that there is a higher power in the universe. Practicing Christians seem to struggle with the idea of higher power, but do say that they believe in God. These ideas express the impact of religion on society's cultures among nations. Education. We know education is extremely important. In a free society, we are free to choose our educators. America offers secular learning and faith-based learning. Secular is the societal humanistic perspective, and faith-based is the Christ-centered worldview, like we have here at HLG. In school, students learn and grow, they develop creativity and individuality. These traits are significant in contributing to a free society and its overall success. Charity. Charity is the generosity and helpfulness to those in need. In a free society, we have the ability to be financially stable and ch charitable, so we can contribute to the well-being of others. We are not a socialistic society. If we were a socialistic society, we'd all be given equal wages where we wouldn't have the room to give. We are able to choose where our money goes, and this develops a sense of comfort and support in our culture. I found it significant that during 2020, Americans gave a record $471 billion to charity. During 2020, we were battling the global pandemic. So I think this is 
extremely important because even in a time of instability, Americans were so charitable that they set record high amounts. And in contrast, Europeans donated 5.4 billion in 2020. So we can see Americans are much more charitable. Government welfare. The government is to provide for the general welfare. Examples of this may be through financial aid for school, Medicaid, food stamps, unemployment, social security, and much more. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we suffered a time of uncertainty. People were losing their jobs, losing their homes, they couldn't even pay their bills. The government stepped in with stimulus checks to provide a financial cushion to citizens in order to survive. This is a great example of when the government had a limited role, but stepped in when the desire was needed. To wrap up everything, I want to emphasize that you live in a free society. America is free. We have opportunity, freedom, and prosperity. We flourish with the ability to do as we will with the security of government services. Individuals can per choose personal life standing that is separate from societal standings. Having the rights to religion, education, charity, and government welfare all pertain to the importance of cultural institutions in a free society. Thank you. Howdy. My name is Jesse Cole, and I am the Senior Free Society Scholar. Now, to start off my presentation, I want you all to imagine something with me. Imagine that you are in a crowd of people listening to a middle-aged gentleman give some sort of presentation, sermon, or lecture. Without even thinking about it, he references an object from his youth, whether it be a floppy disk or a rotary phone or a VHS player. And then he makes some sort of comment along the lines of, well, all the kids in this room probably don't even know what that is. All of you young people have no idea what I'm talking about. It's easy to joke about the ignorance of younger generations such as members of Generation Z. But perhaps we should stop and ask ourselves how ignorant or even knowledgeable are the members of Generation Z? If they haven't been taught what a floppy disk is, can we also assume that they have not been taught the importance of the three foundations of a free society? Now to answer these questions, I have researched the three individual pillars of a free society and what Generation Z knows, thinks, and believes about these three pillars. But first, I am going to bog you down with some definitions. So we just had three excellent presentations about the three foundations of a free society, but just for a brief overview, the free market involves the protection of private property rights and allows for creativity and innovation. Second, we have democratic form of government, which understands the value of human life and allows for citizens to pursue their goals and dreams and speak out against corruption. Thirdly, we have strong social and cultural institutions, which provide aid in working towards solving, solving social problems and promote flourishing and growth in communities. All of these three things combined form a foundation that a free society can be built upon. Next, I want to talk a little bit about Generation Z, who they are and what they stand for. Now, the technical definition is Generation Z is usually those born between 1997 and 2012, making them between the ages of 25 and 9 years old. And the things that they are passionate about, in my research there were three reoccurring topics that kept coming up. They are all about self-expression. They love phrases like, you do you and live your truth, pursue what makes you happy in life. Second, they are very gung-ho about protecting the environment, reduce, reuse, recycle, and all of that. And finally, they love equality, equal opportunities, care, and care and treatment for everyone. Now I'm going to move into the three foundations of a free society and what Generation Z thinks of them, starting off with a free market economy. Now in order to talk about this, I have to pose the question, what is capitalism? If that question was asked in today's society, there would be a plethora of different answers. Author Michael Novak defines capitalism as a privilege, something that protects private property rights. 
Furthermore, under capitalism, the main cause of wealth is fresh ideas, ventures, and exercise know-how. Some people may choose to use fewer words than that and simply define capitalism as a free market economy. That is the technical definition, at least. For various reasons, known or unknown, Generation Z has developed a completely different idea about what capitalism really is. So first thing I would like to point out is that Generation Z is very entrepreneurial in nature. They love the idea of denying the man and the regular 9 to 5 desk job and pursuing their own goals and passions in their career. Investor and advisor Shafin Tojani defined that Generation Z is rapidly becoming known as the most entrepreneurial generation ever, with 62% of Gen Zers indicating that they have started or intend to start their own business. Next, Generation Z is also all about free enterprise. In a study published by Students for Liberty, they claim that 83% of Millennials and Gen Zers still support free enterprise. Now these are two things that are heavily supported by a capitalist form of government. And yet, 49% of Gen Zers favor a socialist form of government over capitalism. Now, why is this? The biggest reason is the presence of corporate welfare in our economy. So, Generation Z sees corporate welfare, something that is not at all a capitalist ideal, but they don't know that. All they see is the government pouring hundreds or thousands of dollars into large corporations and thus drowning out small and startup businesses, the kinds of businesses that Generation Z wants to own themselves someday. And thus you can see why Generation Z is maybe a little bit more averted to the idea of capitalism. Moving on to the second pillar, we have democratic form of government. Now, democracy is all about the celebration of human rights. In the Declaration of Independence, there are outlined the three famous rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But there is also another right that is not quoted quite so often, and that is the right that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and institute new government. Now, anyone without any preconceived notions or biases can read the Declaration of Independence and see why it is such an integral part to a free society. Unfortunately, Generation Z is a generation that has been stuffed full of different preconceived notions and biases to the point where reading the Declaration of Independence, it sounds like just a bunch of empty words and empty promises. So why is that? Why don't they believe in democracy and the Declaration of Independence? Well, that is because there is competition for the support of Generation Z, and democracy is not playing to win like socialism is. Did you know that literal children are being led to believe that socialism is the answer to all of their problems? All it takes is one algorithm suggestion on social media, and suddenly Generation Z is reading about how socialists want them to have free college. How socialists wants to give higher wages to the underprivileged workers. How socialists wants to go out and plant new trees and save the world so that their grandchildren know what it's like to play outside and get their hands dirty. And Gen Zers who sit inside and watch Netflix all day hear that and think, yeah, that sounds great. Now, what are their parents telling them? The parents of Generation Z who actually understand the importance of democracy to our society. They're telling their children to go work 40 hours a week and spend thousands of dollars on a practical degree so that they can work 9 to 5 in an office for the rest of their life. I'm not saying that's what all parents say or that I disagree with parents. I think that in a lot of ways there's a lot of truth and value to that. But can you see why a child who is easily influenced could look at those two options and decide, yeah, I don't think that democracy is for me. Socialism supports the things that I believe in. Now moving on to the final pillar, and that is strong social and cultural institutions. Khan Academy defines these as mechanisms or patterns of social order focused on meeting social needs such as government, economy, education, family, health care, and religion. A specific institution of this kind is the church, which is arguably the most underappreciated and undervalued aspect of a free society. And this is largely in part because of the fact that most of Generation Z views the church as ineffective, judgmental, and hypocritical. 
Now, the relationship between Generation Z and the church is quite a tragic bundle of misconfusion. So, basically, Generation Z is more liberal in their way of thinking, and on contrast to that, the church is more conservative in their beliefs. And so they treat Generation Z with judgment, and Generation Z responds by dissociating from the church. The church preaches a message of love, and yet they ostracize the youth of this country, and the Generation Z labels Christians as hateful and judgmental because of this. Now, if they could actually collaborate, they would see that Generation Z and the church actually have several similar beliefs. The Bible tells Christians in Genesis 2.15 that the Lord placed man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it taking care of the beautiful earth that God has given us. Later in John 13, 34, it says, So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Despite their similar values, the church and Generation Z are unable to collaborate in many areas, and both groups are plagued by the oxymoron of indifferent passion. In conclusion, Generation Z has been misled. They have been led to believe that capitalism and democracy will prevent them from accomplishing their entrepreneurial goals. And thus they passionately defy the supposed old rich white men who run this country and they live their own truth. A self-proclaimed 17-year-old socialist appeals to her fellow Gen Zers by passionately calling out that the tools to build interracial, intergenerational working class power are here if we, the generation whose souls have not yet been crushed by capitalism, choose to use these tools, we can shift the tide in favor of socialism, the only system that will guarantee us a livable planet and life unburdened from economic exploitation, crushing debt, and racial caste. This passion is mirrored by a seeming indifference towards the flaws in their own logic and reasoning. According to Executive Director Marion Smith, when one in four Americans want to eliminate capitalism and embrace socialism, we know that we have failed to educate about the historical and moral failings of these ideologies. It is easy to point fingers and laugh at all the children who supposedly do not know what a floppy disk is. It is harder to stand up for the foundations on which this country was built, to accept that mistakes were made and yet proclaim the victories and decisions that have brought us to liberation in the society that we live in today. Do not treat ignorance and false knowledge with indifference. On paper, everything Generation Z believes in lines up with the three foundations of a free society, but they have been misled to believe otherwise. Breach their indifferent attitudes, converse, understand, and seek to guide the youth towards a society that is free and founded on the very things that they are passionate about. Thank you all very much for your time.